in worship, let's uh, hear our call to worship, which is from Psalm 105 in words that we will sing in a few moments. But it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearers of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. We're going to see this morning that as we gather to worship, as we gather to uh, come before God, we have this privilege, these two things that go hand in hand. We get the privilege of coming and seeking God and giving thanks to him for what he has done for us. But we also have this privilege, this joy, this reason to rejoice in that as we do that, we share the gospel with those around us and we get to share the gospel with others. At times that's challenging, that's difficult, but it is a privilege and a blessing. Um, So we're able to glory in his name and and let let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice because he is our strength. He is our ever present help. So let's stand, if we're able, and sing together from Sing Psalms, Psalm 105, and we are going to sing verses marked 1 to 9. Let's stand and sing. here together this morning. We come together, uh, we gather in order to give thanks to you, that you are the Lord. You are the one who has revealed yourself to us, that you have revealed yourself by name, that you are Yahweh the Lord. And Lord, so we come before you now and we call on that name, that beautiful name by which you have revealed yourself to us. 
And Lord, we want to give thanks because you have made known your good works to your people. Lord, that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. And that uh, you have made promises in the past uh, to those you have called to yourself. And Lord, that those promises have been recorded and reiterated, repeated generation after generation for thousands of years. And now we are gathered here today as hearers, as recipients, as those who receive those same promises. So we praise you for that. We glory in your mighty name. And Lord, we pray that as we gather, as we seek you, that you would cause our hearts to rejoice in you. Lord, that we would look to you for our strength, that we would continually lean on you when life becomes wearisome, when we feel overwhelmed by the pressures that we face, when we feel like we cannot go on, Lord, that you would be our strength and our energy, that you would be powerfully at work in each and every one of us here. Because, Lord, as we gather, we remember the amazing, wondrous works that you have done, the miracles that you have performed in the past, And Lord, the greatest of all of these that you have, uh, through the the promises that you made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, promises to, to bless not only them and their family, but to bless the whole world through uh, one of their offspring. Lord, that amazing, amazing miracle, that amazing blessing that you have given us in our Savior Jesus. We thank you for him, that he is the full uh, revelation of you, that anything we need to know about you, we can learn from him. Lord, we give thanks and praise you in his name. And we ask, Lord, that as we gather just now, that you would meet with us and speak to us, that we would see more and more of Jesus. And Lord, that as we delight in him and as we seek to follow him in your strength, that you would help us to share this good news with others for a thousand generations. Lord, that others would be brought in to your family. And Lord, we pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters who are not able to join with us right now here today. Lord, that wherever they are, that you would comfort them and strengthen them and draw them to yourself. Lord, some of them are uh, busy with work. Others are laid up with illness. Lord, some of our brothers and sisters are maybe just overcome with uh, tiredness or weariness or stress this morning, have been distracted by other things. And Lord, we pray that with each and every one of them, that you would uh, speak to their hearts even now, that they would be comforted and strengthened in Christ. And Lord, while we are not uh, united physically in the same place this morning with them, that we would be united as brothers and sisters in our Savior, Jesus. So we ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, now stand, and we are going to sing together the hymn, More About Jesus. Let's stand and worship together. Oh, 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 oh. 
continue our uh, study in the book of Colossians, the letter to the Colossians, and we are going to be in Colossians chapter 1 and reading from verse 24 uh, down to the end of verse 5 in chapter 2. But just to recap, remember that Paul is writing this letter from, uh, from prison and he is writing it to the church in Colossae, a church that he didn't plant and writing to believers that many of whom he has not met uh, face to face, as we're going to see in this morning's reading. Um, and in his letter, he began, remember, with this prayer, uh, this prayer of gratitude for the faith and the love and the hope that he could see was evident in them as a body of believers. And also this prayer of gratitude for the gospel that he knew uh, was what brought this faith, hope and love about. Yeah, and so he had that prayer of, of gratitude and then also this prayer of growth that as the gospel was at work in them, that they would continue uh, to grow in their Christ likeness and that the gospel would shape their life day by day as they walked, right? That it would start to affect every aspect of their life, that they would grow in the knowledge of God and in their walk of life. And then as he did that, as he's, as he's praying about what the gospel does in their hearts and in their lives, he just boils over in this hymn, this hymn of worship where he is uh, celebrating the fact that Christ is first in creation, that Christ is first in the church, that Christ is first in reconciling humanity to God. And therefore, because Christ is first or supreme in creation and in the church and in restoring uh, creation to God, that therefore Christ should be first in our lives. So he's been praying for them and then he boils over in worship to God. And, as, and, and then it's on the back of that that we now come into these verses in Colossians 1 verses 24 onwards. So let's uh, pick up the reading there. And it says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his of this mystery which is Christ in you the hope of glory we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ for this i toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, 
to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Amen. Let's pray together before we look at this passage. Lord, as we turn to your word now, we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. Lord, that as we look at your word, it wouldn't just be an intellectual exercise. We wouldn't just come away uh, with interesting facts or details, but rather that this God-breathed word that you have spoken would breathe life into our hearts. And here, Lord, that we would find the encouragement and the strength and the energy that we lack. And we ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've ever found yourself asking the question, was it worth it? Right? You've spent time and money investing in something only to ask the question, was it worth it? Was it worth all the effort, all the struggle? Just this uh, summer at the Dornoch Show, um, there was a, a stall that caught uh, someone in my family's attention, and it was to fish for rubber ducks. And you were given a four-foot broom handle with a massive oversized hook on the end of it, and there was rubber ducks that were three feet away with a big hook on the top of them, and for... Uh, the princely sum of four pounds, you had the privilege of hooking a duck. And if you hooked the duck, you got a prize, right? And the prize that you got was something cheap and plastic that was about 30p or 50p. But for the privilege of, or for the princely sum of four pounds, you got the privilege of, of hooking this duck which was no challenge whatsoever, you could have picked it up like that, to hook this thing and you got this prize. And I was trying to convey, before we were fleeced, I was trying to convey <laughs> the lesson, is it worth it? You need to ask the question, is it worth it? Look at what the prize is. Is it worth the four pounds? And apparently um, it was. Um, so, <laughs> so we spent four pounds and got the 50p toy. Um, but you ask the question, was it worth it? And as we hear the call of the gospel, Jesus himself encourages us to ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? In Luke 14, he says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost? He's saying to follow me is going to cost you something. And you need to ask the question, is it worth it? And obviously, he's asking that question uh, rhetorically where you are meant to look at it at your own life and look at the cost and look at what is at stake and look at what he offers and come to a resounding yes. Right? That to follow him is most definitely worth it. And there will be some of us here in this room that are at the stage in life where uh, we are asking ourselves, is it worth it to follow Jesus? We haven't yet put our faith in him and we are weighing up the question, is it worth following Christ? Is it worth paying what it is gonna, fall, it is gonna cost me to follow him? And others of us here are believers who at this moment are maybe spent and weary and with the tasks that we are facing, are asking, is it worth it to proceed, to continue to follow Christ in what I'm being called to do? And what I want to do this morning is, is to show you uh, from this passage what Paul is saying to us, that it is supremely worth suffering to follow Christ. That whatever it costs us in following Christ is worth it. 
And we're going to do this just by working through the passage and, and looking at it under four headings. And some of them are bigger chunks and other ones are just one or two verses. But we're going to see that uh, Paul is rejoicing in suffering for Christ. And then we are going to see the purpose of this ministry of suffering for Christ. And then we are going to see the energy for suffering for Christ. And then finally, just to ask uh, that question, why it is worth suffering for Christ. So let's begin by looking at how Paul rejoices in suffering for Christ in verses 24 to 27. It says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. Paul has, has just concluded with this hymn celebrating uh, what Christ has done. Right, celebrating that Christ is supreme over everything. And he says uh, that he, he does this in order that they would not shift from the hope of the gospel that they have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Right? He's, he's saying there's this awesome good news about Jesus and, and he's boiling over in worship and he says, I'm a minister of that. And he immediately goes on to say, I now rejoice in my suffering in this ministry, right? I rejoice in suffering for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. So Paul, this idea that Christ is first, this idea that he celebrates isn't some ethereal idea. It's not just some intellectual exercise, but actually it has so gripped his life that he is physically suffering, that his life is physically harder, right? He's not talking about the challenge of, of just trying to focus while he reads scripture, but rather his body is physically suffering. In my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. That he is physically suffering and not because of something he has done, something stupid he has done, or physically suffering because he is trying to gain something himself, Right? It's not like uh, the pain of a hard day's work in order to get paid. But listen to what he says. My suffering for your sake. My suffering for your sake. He is physically suffering because of the gospel um, or for the gospel because of other believers. And the amazing thing is that the people he is suffering for aren't friends. It's not his family. Right? It's actually strangers that he has never met. And we've seen just last week, a few verses before, that these strangers are people who are actually alienated from God, hostile in their minds, and doing evil deeds. Right? And he is suffering in his life in order that they might hear this gospel. And you say, well, why is he doing that? <laughs> And he tells us why. He says, I am doing it to fill up what was lacking in Christ's affliction. And maybe if, when you hear that, you should really cry out and say, what? Right? It sounds blasphemous. What is lacking in Christ's affliction? Is Christ, has Christ not done everything that is needed for us to be saved? How on earth is Paul filling up what was lacking in Christ's affliction? There's certainly nothing lacking in the sacrifice that Jesus has made and his atoning sacrifice. Because just later on into the next chapter, Paul is going to talk about how Christ has taken all our sin and shame and has nailed it to the cross. And because Christ has done that, we have forgiveness. And then later on in Romans, Paul talks about how um, in our own efforts, we can do nothing to save ourselves, but actually that it's what Christ has done that saves us. And then in Hebrews, repeatedly, three times, the author talks about how Christ has done what is needed once for all. Right? That Christ has done everything needed to atone for his people's sin and to redeem people and bring them into his kingdom. So what on earth is lacking? It's not the love of Christ that was lacking and falling short. Nor was it his ability to save. Christ is able to save. So what is Paul filling up? What is it that is actually lacking? <clears throat> and what is missing 
uh, between the love of Christ and the church or the people in Colossae, what was, what was lacking was this personal presentation of Jesus to them. Right? Christ had done everything that was necessary in order for them to be saved. But how would they be saved if they never heard that gospel, if they never heard that good news? They needed someone to personally come at a cost to themselves and bodily get themselves there and present the gospel to the church, to the people in Colossae. To present them this gift of God's love, of Christ's love to them in the gospel. So Paul becomes the, the physical embodiment of Christ's love. And takes that gospel and presents it to uh, the church in Ephesus. And because he has done that and physically done that and presented the gospel there, others have then taken up that gospel and physically gone and presented it to the people in Colossae. And because of that, because of Paul's physical suffering in getting the gospel out there, these people have been brought into the kingdom. And Paul is saying, in my body I am filling up what was lacking. What was lacking was this conduit, this connection between the gospel of Jesus and what he had done and the people who hadn't heard it. And the only way they are going to hear it is if somebody goes and shares that message. And Paul is saying that this, this act of doing it, this suffering of living out the gospel is actually ministry. Right, that, that, is, that it is his ministry in verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship or the management or the oversight from God that was given to me for you. To make the word of God fully known. Paul is saying, I am a servant. God has called me to serve him. And the way I serve him is by suffering in this life. Suffering to make the gospel known. To let other people hear this message. And that he does this not complaining, not begrudging, not feeling that it's unfair. But he actually rejoices in the privilege of being able to share this gospel. It's this thing that has caused him to boil over in worship just a few verses before. Has so gripped his own heart that, the, that he rejoices in being able to share it with others. Even if it means being shipwrecked or beaten or stoned or persecuted or falsely accused or imprisoned. That he is rejoicing that others are getting to hear this message. Paul is literally in jail at this point because of the gospel that he has shared and is now shared with the church in Colossae and they are enjoying the freedom of that gospel. So it's not a leap of the imagination to think that Paul could conceivably be sitting in jail and thinking this sucks, right? This is not fair. I'm the one who has shared the gospel and I'm locked up in prison and they're out there enjoying it. But instead of complaining, he's in, in prison rejoicing and celebrating and writing them this letter just to encourage them in this love that Christ has for them. And he is able to rejoice because he has this remit, this job that he has been given to do. In verse 25, I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for your sake to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul is saying, I rejoice because I was given one job, one remit, and that was to share with you God's word. God's revelation of Jesus, that in Christ God has done everything necessary to bring you into the kingdom. And then I was given the privilege of being the one who gets to take that message and share it with you. To open God's word to people and explain it. And it's this mystery, it's this mysterious thing. And, and what is mysterious about it? It's mysterious because God has revealed his word to both the Jews, both to his covenant people that he has called in, and also to the Gentiles. 
Right? In other words, anyone who is not a Jew. And this gospel has come, and I've had the privilege of sharing it. And the mystery is that God takes these two groups of people that have this animosity to one another, this distrust of one another, and he unites them and brings them together. And friends, the application for us this morning is that Christ has done absolutely everything that is necessary to bring us into the kingdom. And you and I, if we are believers, are only believers here today because other believers before us suffered in order to share the gospel with us. And some of the suffering might have been low-key, right? Maybe it was just Sunday school teachers who diligently put in hours and prayer to share the gospel with us when we were little. Or SU leaders, or neighbors who shared the gospel. Some of us are here because somebody overcame their embarrassment and their awkwardness and spoke about Jesus to us. But friends, we are also here today as believers because others have gone before and suffered and laid down their lives in order that we would have this gospel. And literally not that long ago, right, that within Scotland, within the last couple centuries, people have died in order to bring the gospel to us. And you and I are here because they were willing to lay down and suffer. And the awesome thing is that this gospel is completely sufficient, right? This good news is enough and is all that is needed to save the lost people around us in Dorna or in the community. But there's something lacking in Christ's affliction, and that is that somebody needs to go from here and share the gospel with those people. If they don't hear it, if no one goes and tells them, how will they know? And Paul is saying, I rejoice because of this privilege I have of sharing this gospel with you. And even as I suffer for it, it gives me joy because I'm seeing the hope that it brings you. This hope which is uh, Christ living in you. This hope of glory that you have. So even as he suffers in jail with nothing. That he rejoices because he knows the hope that has gripped the lives of these strangers. That he has never met but are now united with him as brothers and sisters in Christ. And he realizes that as he suffers for this, he is, it is actually evidence of his own union with Christ, his own relationship with Christ, right? That Christ has suffered on the cross and done everything that is needed to save Paul. And now Paul has the privilege of suffering alongside his Savior in a small way, in a minuscule way compared to what Christ has borne, right? But in this suffering as he follows it's a, a evidence to him of his own union with Christ. And he can see the fruit of that in the faith of others. So he is able to rejoice in suffering for the gospel of Christ. But the second thing that I want you to see is, is the purpose of this ministry of suffering for Christ. In verse 28. And we've touched on this already. But verse 28 just brings it out all the more. Verse 27 said, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Christ in you as, as a Gentile. Christ in you as somebody who was outside the covenant. Christ in you as somebody who was alienated and hostile in your mind towards God and doing evil deeds. And it's this amazing mystery that God would place Christ in your heart and my heart, and unite us to himself. And that Christ, that God has done that for us in Christ is our hope of glory. And Paul goes on in verse 28 to show us his purpose in all of this. He says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. 
Paul is saying, my whole purpose in this suffering, my whole purpose in sharing the gospel in the first place in Ephesus, my whole purpose for remaining in prison and rejoicing just now in suffering, my whole purpose in writing this letter to you is in order that I might proclaim Christ, that I might warn everyone, that I might teach you in all wisdom in order that you might be able to, I might be able to present you mature in Christ. He's saying, I I proclaim, in other words, I preach, I advocate, I announce, I celebrate. It's not about just passing on a a, a piece of information, but, but shouting it from the rooftop with his whole life. That he wants to preach this gospel. And then he says, I I do it in order that you would be mature in Christ. Right? He said, I'm doing it so that when I stand before the throne, there's going to be people next to me who I don't know their names. But they're there because I proclaimed the gospel. And that gives me such joy. And then he says, I'm doing this warning everyone, right? It's not just uh, just the positive, but also the, the caution, the warning of the gospel. Which involves admonishing or rebuking or instructing people. That he he would do that with his life. And then to teach them. Not just the negative side of it. But the positive side. To teach and guide and instruct. In order. uh, And he does this in order that they would have all wisdom. In verse 28 there. Him we proclaim warning everyone. Teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And when Paul says, with all wisdom, he's not saying, I got all the wisdom. I'm the wise guy. You guys need to listen to me. But as he says, all wisdom, wisdom is, is our capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective, as one of the commentators put it. Right? That wisdom is us being in a right understanding and a right relationship with God. And Paul is saying, I'm proclaiming, I'm warning, I'm teaching you with all wisdom. And the way that we get that wisdom is from God's word. Proclaiming the word. And Christ himself is called the wisdom of God. The word of God in 1 Corinthians 1. And Paul is saying, I do all of this, I suffer in this way because I want to present you and everyone else mature in Christ. That you would be grown up and mature in Christ. That he would be rooted, he would be living in your heart and you would be rooted in him. And remember, Paul is saying this to a church that has people coming in and saying, Jesus is good. He's the, as I was saying last week, the kind of entry level uh, or gateway level into getting to know God. But there's other stuff you're going to need to learn and know. There's other stuff you're going to have to do. And Paul is saying, no man, I rejoice in suffering for Christ. And I rejoice in doing all of this in order to share with you this gospel. That as I do so, as we look at God's word together. As it's preached. As we hear God's voice. As we look to Jesus in him We have everything we need to grow up in full maturity in Christ. That the whole purpose of ministry is in order that we would be in him. That we'd be rooted in his word. Friends, there is nothing that you need in addition to Christ in order to be in a right relationship with God. There is no added extra, no secret information, no second blessing, but rather Paul is saying that he wants everyone to know God's word and to be rooted in the hope that is presented to us here in Christ Jesus. And just as an application, as an aside for you, the role as as myself, as the pastor and as one of the elders here, and the role of each of the elders and, and our deacons and leadership here, Our sole role here is to guide and teach in the Word of God, right? It's not to put on programs or um, to do loads of different things. Our, Our key role is to present the Word of God to you and to teach it to you and to ourselves. And yes, we do lots of other things, but the whole focus of those other things is meant to be this, right? That together we would hear God speak. And that as we do so, we would be rooted in this mystery, this wisdom that comes from Christ in us. 
and that we would grow up in maturity in him. But maybe as you hear this, right, this suffering for Christ, maybe there's a part of you that as, uh, as Graham so honestly and openly said this morning, every morning driving into work and saying, I cannot do this. I don't have the strength to do this. I feel that every day. Right? And I'm sure if we're being honest, many of us feel this overwhelming weight and think, I cannot do it. And how is Paul able to do it? Was he some kind of superhero? Right? Did he have some awesome, amazing gifting that just made him able to do it and made it so much easier for him? No. Let's look at verse 29 and the energy to suffer for Christ. And this, I've been chewing on this verse for a couple weeks now. Listen, listen to what he says here. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Right? Paul is rejoicing, but he's not rejoicing at a poolside on a lounger. He's not rejoicing because he nailed all the things on his to-do list. He's not rejoicing because he feels like he's just at the peak of humanity and just refined his regime and his uh, workflow and all that kind of stuff. He is rejoicing in that he is suffering for Christ. And actually, as he tries to follow Christ, listen to what he says. I, in this, I toil and struggle. This isn't easy, right? This isn't some hobby. This isn't some pastime. This isn't some kind of religion that he's tagged on to the rest of his life because it helped put a perspective on things and helped him to get through the stuff he wanted to do. This is all-consuming, that as he follows Christ, as we saw in a verse from Luke, that he has taken up his cross and he's following Christ, and a cross is something you carry in order to die on the thing. Right? His whole life has been spent. And he is following Jesus. And he says, this I toil, in this I toil and struggle. And, and the word toil there literally is work that leaves you feeling as if you have taken a beating. Right? Some, of, some of us here have jobs where physically at the end of the day, we maybe feel like someone has just taken a stick to us and beaten us for a few hours. Right? Physically exhausted, mentally exhausted. And Paul is saying, in this I toil. And then the word struggle is to contend or fight or strive earnestly. And, it, and the root word is that is the, the word there is actually the root word where we get the word agony from, right? So Paul is saying, as I as I do this, it is agony. I feel like I have had an absolute beating. But I continue to do this. And you think, well, why? How does he have the strength to do that? Let's read verse 29 again. It says, for this I toil, struggling. And the first time I read it, I thought it said, for this I toil, struggling with all my energy. But it doesn't. Right? He says, for this I toil, I feel like I've had a beating. For this I am in agony. I'm feeling the agony of this, but I do this with all his energy. He says, I'm able to do this because Christ is in me. I wake up in the morning and I feel like I cannot do this. I've got nothing to give, God. I don't know how I'm going to get through the day. But he looks to Christ and he has all of Christ's energy in him and able to face the day then because Christ is at work in him. And it's with all this energy that he, that Christ, powerfully works within me. He said, I can only do this because Christ is in me and, and therefore I rejoice that even as I struggle, it's because Christ is in me and he is helping me to do this. And it's that desire that he has for Christ to see Christ glorified and, and to rejoice in him that he is able to then suffer and share this gospel because Christ's at work in him. And you and I, 
and I think this is probably a global thing, but it's definitely a cultural thing in Scotland, that very often we see a job that needs done, like, like sharing the gospel or going to speak to other people, and we say, I'm not ready. Right? I don't have the ability. I don't have the gifts. There's other people that are more gifted than me and able to do that thing. And I just want to share an illustration that I, I came across in response to that. It's R.C. Sproul, who's now passed away, but he was a, a preacher and a lecturer in the States. And he spoke about meeting a missionary um, who was at work in Africa. And as they were uh, planting a church there, an elderly woman um, who was 70 came to faith. And she was blind and uneducated. And basically impoverished, had very little in terms of skill set or resources. Or even years left of life. Uh, but she was saved and she uh, had a French Bible, which obviously she was blind, she couldn't read. But she took the Bible to the missionary and she said, can you just highlight John 3.16 in red in the Bible for me, please? So he did it and wondered what on earth she wanted that for. And then she took her Bible and went and sat outside the local boys' school. And as she heard the kids coming out, she would call over one or two boys and say, can you speak French? Do you read French? And they would say, they've just been learning and they're delighted to be learning. They'd say, yes, yes, I can. So she said, can you read something for me, please? And she would hand them the Bible and say, can you read the bit in red? And they would read it. And then she would say, do you understand what that says? And she would tell them about Jesus. A simple thing, right? And the missionary was saying that there were 24 young men who were pastors because this woman had done that over the years. And if there was 24 pastors, I'm guessing there was countless others who were also saved. Right? This small thing of this, this zeal, this love for Christ at work in her and willing to lay down her life and say, I have nothing to give, but in your strength, in your energy, I will toil and I will struggle in order that others might hear this good news. Friends, as we find ourselves wanting to cower or give up or hide or stop following Christ, Paul's resounding uh, commendation to us is, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake in order that you would know the fullness of Christ in your life and that you would grow up in maturity. And, and I am willing to struggle and suffer, not in my own ability, but in all his energy because he is powerfully at work in me and he is powerfully at work in you. He gives us the energy to persevere and it is in him alone. So just in conclusion, let's look at it. Why is it actually worth suffering for Christ in verses uh, 1 to 5 of chapter 2? For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Paul is telling them his, of his struggle, not to guilt them, not to put them down, right? Not to make them feel bad about themselves or to make them give him something. But he's saying, I want to tell you about the struggle to encourage you, to encourage you and, and to knit you together in love, right? That you would meet, that, that you would reach that full riches of assurance, of understanding and knowledge of God. He said, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to have the assurance, that confidence to know that what Christ has done for you is enough. Right? The gospel is enough. 
that you don't need something else. You don't need to improve yourself to come to Jesus, but, but come and be a recipient now and receive what he has done for you. That you would know and understand and, and enjoy the knowledge of this mystery that God would unite us, not only together, but unite us to himself. And he said, I'm telling you all this because I don't want anything to come in and steal that from you. I don't want anyone to come and tell you that you need something else. And for him, uh, it was the, the Gnostics coming in and, and saying folk needed something other than Jesus. And for you and I here, the world will, will bombard us with messages. Right? To either just flat out deny Christ or else false teachings that, that we will come across that has this guise of Christianity, but it's Jesus plus something else, right? That if only you had a little bit more faith, you wouldn't suffer, right? If only you gave a little bit more, then you wouldn't struggle. That if only you had a little bit more faith, you would have all the things you want. And that's garbage, right? But we get that message preached to us. And Paul is saying, I want you to know that Christ is enough and it's worth suffering to follow him. I actually rejoice in my suffering to follow him. Verse 24 started off with him saying, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in verse 5 of chapter 2, he ends with the same sentiment. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing. To see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He said, I rejoice in suffering for you, for Christ's sake. Because as I suffer for Christ's sake and see the gospel at work in your life, I see the order that it brings, the unity that it brings as we come together around our Savior Jesus. I see the firmness of that faith growing in your hearts. And therefore I rejoice in my suffering because of the joy it brings me to see your faith grow. Friends, I want to urge you that it is so worth suffering for the sake of Christ. That if you are discouraged this morning and you're tempted to give up, then hold fast and remember that it is Christ at work in you and that it is in his energy that we are able to to persevere because he is powerfully at work in your life. And if this morning you haven't placed your faith in him yet, if you're still weighing up the question, is it worth it to follow him? I want to urge you and encourage you to do so, that you do not need to add anything to the equation, but to hear his call and to come. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your beautiful gospel, for this marvelous good news. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is uh, to be called one of yours. And we pray, Lord, that as we face the struggles of this life, as we suffer for our faith, as we toil and struggle, as at times we maybe feel like we've had a beating, at times where we, to follow you maybe feels like agony, help us to do so in the knowledge that we do it in your energy, that you are powerfully at work in your people. And Lord, I pray that you would unite us in that love, that love for Christ that is demonstrated and lived out in our love for one another. And that you would help us to grow in your word, in the assurance of what you speak, in our knowledge of you. That each of us would grow in maturity so that together on that day that we would stand side by side before your throne in awe and wonder at what you have done. And Lord, that you would bless us with the joy of having others around us who we don't know by name but are there because we were willing to suffer for your sake. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, we are uh, going to have the Lord's Supper now. Um, so uh, we'll, as the kids come in, um,
They'll come in during our, our next singing. But let's, uh, in preparation for the Lord's Supper, stand and sing together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand and worship together. Purchase of blood to every good. 
Amen. Amen.